but over the years I've tried to make it clear to people that I'm I'm really not a treasure hunter okay um, when I first met you you said you wasn't you was heavily into the Native uh, American petroglyphs things like that that's where my true love lies is the study of Native American petroglyphs but you know, it just has a tendency to go into different mysteries and st stories from the past, plausible histories, etc. And over the years, I've had a lot of people send me uh, documents. And one of the first things I do is, you know, try to validate or disprove the document. You know, is it a hoax? Is it a fraud? Uh, is there some truth in it? And some of them, when you receive them, it's, it's pretty clear upon their appearance that it's from an authentic source, but even those can be faked. Um, I was going to tell you about one particular document, and you'll notice that some of these stories, there's always a friend involved, and I use that just simply because I don't want to tell you who it is. <laughs> <laughs> but back in the 70s, a man from down in Mexico approached a friend of mine and he asked for his help in trying to locate, uh, I can't remember what he called it, but his family's fortune that had been left behind uh, a long time ago. And I don't know how much research my friend did on this particular document, um, but another 15 years went by, or, or more, and one day he asked me if I'd be interested in checking out a story down in the same area where I was at at the time, and at the time I was doing research on uh, and documenting numerous sites of what I now call uh, Aztec navigation glyphs. They've been known as key glyphs and they have most commonly been designated as water glyphs. <coughs> so I told him, yeah, I'd, I'd be interested. And so he basically gave me half the story. Uh, I didn't expect, I didn't suspect that at first, but um, we went down to this place, the Arizona Strip, we'll say, and uh, I decided to put a little bit of time and effort into it as to where I had uh, come to think it might be based upon the verbal information that came with it. Because without the verbal information, the document's basically worthless. Um, within probably the first six hours that we were down there, we found several of the things that he had mentioned in this chopped up story that he had sent me, and I knew there was something funny, and so as soon as we got back to cell service, I called him up and I said, there's got to be more to this story. And he said, well, there's always more to the story. And I I got pretty disturbed at him and chewed him out a little bit. And I told him, you know, you either trust me or you don't. If you don't trust me, don't bother me with the story. If you do, send me all the story. Because I'm not going to chase after half a story. And so he agreed that he would send me the the entire thing. And... <laughs> he had a photocopy of a uh, a document that had been written in the uh, in 1900. In the document, it says that it was copied from a much older document, and it was just it was interesting reading through it because I'd already seen some of the things that that uh, were mentioned in the document. In fact, while we were down there, I the hosts that took me into the area, they grew up there. They've lived there their whole life, and they had never seen the things that I spotted as we drove through. 
and that just goes to show that if you don't have an eye for what you're looking for you're going to overlook it i mean these guys been but driving you might overlook today i've been in areas that it's that uh, I've been in there time and time and time again and it took me three or four times that I've been in there until I finally seen you know every time I go in there I see something new and I think that's stupid why didn't I see that before uh huh <laughs> well that was kind of the case here and and they were absolutely fascinated with what I showed them you know we were just driving down the road and I said holy crap what is that and and uh, we all take off and go look at it and it's well, yeah I've been driving down here our whole lives and we've never seen that so anyway but uh, so I'm looking this document over and it's I'm telling you when they made the photocopy it was in pretty bad condition because it was stained and it had dark areas in it and there's several words throughout the document that even today we still can't quite make out what it is but for the most part we've we've pretty much got the story okay but I probably spent a good six months on this document just trying to transcribe it into the original Spanish that it was written in and then I sent it off to a couple of friends of mine they know who they are and uh, they helped with the translation on it and um, one of the key things in this document was a cave. A cave of enormous dimensions containing amounts unknown to any man. Just that so statement so alone, that yeah, that, that caught my attention because, you know, by this time I was in underground city mode. <laughs> And I had heard the stories of the possibilities of uh, Aztecs bringing some treasure up here and so forth, um, which actually actually didn't happen the way that it's gone down in history. Um, but there was an incident that occurred back in Montezuma the first time that it most likely is tied in with but anyway um, I spent a lot of time with this document and trying to figure out the various details and one of the things that was mentioned in it was you had to find rewind to the document the document is being <coughs> Writ it's written by one individual, but he's telling you the story of another individual, which I think might have been his ancestor. <coughs> and he mentions in the document that you've got to find his cave, his personal cave, which he describes as being a large cave, um, but it's, it's clearly not the same cave as the enormous cave uh, of, um, let's see, he calls the first one, or the smaller one, a cave of large dimension. And the other one he calls an enormous cave containing amounts unknown to any man. Well, anyhow, one of the features that you have to look for, well, aside from the monuments that it mentions in a certain pattern, um, but the smaller cave. And in order to find the smaller cave, you have to find his corral. We, we don't know whether this is a corral that was made out of wood. He referred to it as, I can't remember the words used, natural corral or reinforced corral with stone. Okay. One day we're down there messing around trying to figure out exactly where this is talking about and one of the guys that's lived there his whole life he says oh, I know where some ruins are okay he says, you want to go see him I said sure so he takes us out to this place and we drive up on it and I I get out of my truck and I'm looking at it and I turn to my buddy who was very much involved with this with me and uh, I said 
this is the corral. <laughs> so we started uh, documenting the site, measuring. The walls were four feet thick, about four feet high. It was very clear it was a, a corral. And I may include a, a sketch of that. <coughs> um, in order to continue with the document and to find his cave, you had to know where the corral was because the instructions are that you position yourself in the corral, look in a certain direction at a certain time of day, and it would reveal certain things. Well, we probably spent two or three trips uh, trying to locate this cave, and then one day, I was trying to give instructions to Rick, who didn't make it here today, <coughs> and he took the wrong turn and ended up in a certain area, and he finds this monument. <laughs> and he made note of it, and uh, on upon a return trip down there, we decided to go and take a look at it. and. Interestingly enough, it turns out that this is probably a monument that marks this smaller cave. Hmm. And the only validation that we have that we, we know it's there is at the particular location, there's a lot of slide rock. And uh, at the time, I was having some serious problems with my knees, and so hiking was out of the question at the time. And so my buddies that went with us on that trip, they went up onto the rock slide and started going through the rocks, and just about every rock they picked up had half-inch chisel marks in it. And so we know the cave's there, but it's been backfilled, no question. Uh, one of the guys brought back one of the rocks. It had seven chisel marks in it. And I don't mean just a, you know, a chip in the rock. I'm talking about, you know, chisel marks that are this long. And they're, they're all exactly the same size. The deeper you got into the rock slide, the more fresh the chisel marks were. Up on the surface, you could tell they were pretty badly worn. You know, so you know it's been there for a while. But in this particular cave, if, if you find the cave, then he says that in the document that you gotta go in the cave and on the floor there'll be two fairly large stones and one of them is marked with a number one and the other one's marked with a number two. And he doesn't mention the number one any longer. He mentions number two, and you turn it over and you dig down so far and you should come across some old cow hides, some oak planks, and he explains what's in there. But the, the primary thing that's got my attention is a small ebony box, if I remember right. That's how he described it. And in the box, he says, that what's in the box is more valuable than anything that's in that cave. And he describes some of the contents as being uh, jewels um, and a piece of, I think he called it berry paper. It's like parchment. And that it had instructions written on it in a language that he did not understand in mule's blood. He found this or something? And no, this is what's being described in the document. And he said that that's what explains where the enormous cave is. The one that oh, has right. amounts. Yeah, right. yeah. Now, he does give instructions on where this enormous cave is, but he also says that that parchment paper that's written in mule's blood that it describes where the indigenous uh, who used to be in that area, where they, where they hid it. And he tells you what to look for and everything. Unfortunately, it's on National Monument property. <laughs> so, Naturally. So that part of it has come to a standstill. But if Rick were here, he could tell you the next part. Now, Rick is a uh, 
I don't know how he puts it, but he's basically a paleontologist. He went through the entire college program, and within a week's time of his graduation, he threw it all away. <laughs> um, he had some good reasons for it. But we were down in a particular area and uh, looking for additional evidences of this enormous cave containing amounts unknown to any man. And of course, they don't let you drive in there, so you have to you have to do some walking. And Rick finds these ancient irrigation canals. And when I first saw them on Google Earth, I thought, well, this could have been CC camps. And the more we looked into it we realized that these cannot be from the CC days because number one they weren't in this area and number two one of the lava flows that's in that area have flowed into one of the ditches so clearly the ditch was there when the lava was flowing how long ago was the lava flowing don't know and if you look at the old Spanish maps of New Spain, uh, Granada Nova maps, etc., you'll see these various cities that are mentioned, especially around the uh, tributaries to the Grand Canyon or the Colorado River. And this particular location is right where one of the primary cities, in fact, in one document that I was reading, it said that this was their capital city at one time and it's called uh, Granada uh, Abacus Nuke Granada um, why would the Spanish put these things on their maps you know like the city of Tantantic Granada Murata uh, I can't remember all the other names, but where, where did these, when did the Spanish have time to build these cities? Or were they ancient uh, Indian villages that they documented and put on these maps? Uh, were, were they inhabited when they got there? Uh, or did they come from an earlier time? like what I suggested regarding uh, Antonio de Espejo. So obviously there was a civilization there. This particular irrigation system covers roughly 300 acres. But yet there's no sign of a city, just a big lava flow. Now up on top of this lava flow the archaeologist had discovered a village and they've made the determination that the majority of this village had been covered with this lava flow. Really? So we have that going for us. Um, I don't know what more I can tell you about it but we are still actively looking for this and the man mentioned in the document his smaller cave or his personal cave <laughs> According to the document, it, I, I believe he was catering to the Spanish. Basically, he was the middleman. It, it describes him as a Mexican Indian. He was probably the middleman between the Spanish and the local tribespeople that were in that area. <coughs> um, and it said that he, at one time he was the possessor of those mountains. Well. About the time we found what we believe is his corral, um, we had circumvented certain barriers and drove back into it, and which we weren't supposed to do. <laughs> and the owner of the property saw that someone had drove back there, and we're kind of parked behind a hill and trying to keep out of sight. And, but he knew someone was back there and he come driving back and we thought, you know what, it's probably better if we just get in the truck and drive out and just meet him along the way because at least then if he's got a gun we can just floor it. 
So we pull up next to him, and he was he was kind of he was angry. He said, "What are you guys doing back in here?" We told him, "Oh, I was over here looking at some ruins." And he said, "Well, didn't you see the sign?" And I said, "Well, actually, no, we didn't." Are you telling us there's a sign? He says, "Well, there used to be." <laughs> so, <coughs> but yeah, the whole time he was talking to us, he's got a 44 at the door. And uh, but anyway, after talking to us for a little bit, he calmed right down and turned out to be a pretty nice guy. And he says, "You know, I've been riding my horse through there my whole life, and I've never seen those ruins." <laughs> but uh, anyway, so we got to talking to him, and uh, his family has property down in that area. And we asked him, "How did your family acquire that property? I mean, how long ago?" And he says, "Well." He says, through my wife, and you might, well, I won't mention that because it kind of gives a location away. He said that when they first went there and were homesteading back in the day, that they picked out a piece of property and they'd run into an old Mexican Indian that was down there. And he explained that it was his property. It was it was a Spanish land grant. And it's not one the academic world's gonna want to talk about, otherwise they have a big old argument like they did with the Peraltas. Um, I've tried to research that and I can't find anything on it. But he said that they made friends with this Mexican Indian and over the years, they'd become really good friends, and he carved out a big old piece of property and gave it to them. And that's how their family ended up down there. The thing that I thought was fascinating is that he told us that this Mexican Indian owned all that property and carved out a big piece and gave it to him. And he didn't know anything about the document. He didn't know anything about why we were even down there. But yet the document says that this Mexican Indian was once the possessor of those mountains. Mm. This is probably, I'm guessing based on all the evidence, probably somewhere in the mid-1800s. So... Dan, that's why it, I like you, man, because you track down the same kind of interesting things that I like tracking down. It's just... And, uh, well, thanks for sharing... These, bo these books are full of uh, stories such as this. Um, unfortunately, I write tight-lipped. <laughs> uh, nowadays, not so much as I used to, but there's always more to these stories, just like my friend told me. There's always more to the story. And I don't know, hopefully one day we'll be able to pursue further any of these stories. Um, I'm working on a, another set of books that I hope will be ready in the next 30 to 60 days. It's a three volume set of over a thousand pages and it's basically a compilation of what I've written about some of these sites over the years. And I've had to go through them and tone some of them down a little bit and some of them I've added a little bit more to them. But you know, just depends on how much you like to read, I guess. So I know this, Dan. You're one heck of a researcher, man. You like to figure things out. But you don't. You're like me. You don't have near enough time to track them all down, man. If somebody came to you and they're you willing to share something, an adventure with the right people, that you could cut them in on the the right adventure or not? Well, or you already got people you're with. Right now, there is an individual sitting here with us who. I met for the first time on the phone about two or three days ago. Um, I invited him to come down for these interviews, just to sit here and listen or even ask questions. And he's sitting over there, <coughs> and he has no idea that if he wanted to get involved in one of these projects, I'll find one that fits, that fits him. And I'll, you know, I have no reason to mistrust, distrust him, mistrust him, 
whatever the correct grammar is. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm I'm more than willing to sh share the stories because I just I can't go after them. I can't you know do them. I, can't yeah. go after everything I, I got six of them down in Mexico, and the last time I mentioned them uh, in what was going to be a, a giveaway. Um, good hell, I couldn't believe all the naysayers that popped up and. You know, you're going to Mexico, you're crazy. Oh my, no, you're not crazy. If you're not going to Mexico, you're chicken shit. It's what you are. Um, I have no intention of going down. I, I don't, there's too much here to do. Uh, I've, I've got people to work on some of these projects and, and I'm always looking for someone to go after some of these things. You want a really entailed story? Hey, I've got them. If you want a real simple one, but can't seem to find a solution, you're more than welcome to it too. You know how many people I've turned on to the Sugarloaf Gold thing? How many? I'll bet you a dozen. Uh -huh. Guess how many of them's gone back there more than one time? Not very many. Only one guy, and he right. can barely get around. He's considered handicapped. But at least he's that's, that's got what it takes. A lot of people, they think, oh, hey, I'm just going to go out there and dig this up, man. It'll be great party time. It's great. You know, they, well, don't, they don't understand all the research he, he, that has to happen, all the legwork that's got to hmm. happen, all the, you know, all the twists and turns that you got to make. You can about. sum it up with the back of Gail Rhodes's last book. And I'm not knocking the book. I actually, I, I think that was one of the best books that's been put out. Um... But on the back of the book, it's got, shows a guy standing in a cave with a flashlight and a helicopter outside. Yeah. And he's got his <coughs> flashlight shining on a dead Spaniard, a skeleton, still in its armor, yeah. with his arm draped over a chest that there's no way in hell ten men could carry. <laughs> it's not that easy. <laughs> Never will be. Speaking of the chest, man, just I don't know if you've seen my video, that guy that I met that has, oh, he's just got like 20 of them. They're from the 16, 15, 16, 1700s. They're iron heavy, that locking mechanism, man, they're cool. They're pretty cool. I only know one individual who has actually found a chest. I only have a vague idea of how big it was. And it had probably only been in the ground 150 years. And as soon as it was exposed to the, the elements, it was basically turned to dust. Okay, with well, that said, that's a wrap on that one.